Welcome back to Real Repairs for Real Customers, where the quality has to be good enough to charge real money. <laughs> so we have the occasion of our annual inspection of our facility since we work on aircraft, and I thought it might be of general interest to the community to see what's involved in that. Also, we're going to go into the field and work on a split-out armrest on a Lincoln. So I think you're going to enjoy that as well. Ready? Let's go. So I thought I'd share some excerpts from the agreement with the certified facility to show what's involved in doing work for aircraft. Here we have Advanced Restoration Technologies Incorporated, and that's me, a non-certified FAA maintenance facility contractor. That's true. I am not certified uh, in this facility, which means that I need to work under the auspices of a certified facility. That certified facility is the FBO, or the Fixed Base Operator. And we continue, who offers to perform maintenance functions used on a FAR-91, 135, or 121 air carrier aircraft for the FBO. The FAR are the Federal Aviation Requirements. Part 91 refers to general aviation. That's when some guy owns an airplane and takes his buddy out for a golf uh, outing. Uh, part 135 is primarily charter aircraft where you do have paying customers, but you need one pilot. And uh, part 121 has to do more with the airlines where you also have paying customers and where you usually need two or more pilots. So as you could imagine, uh, going from part 91 to part 135 to part 121, the requirements uh, become stricter. The more stringent requirements when it comes to more people traveling, more paying customers. The FBO chief inspector will perform an on-site inspection of the facility. This on-site inspection will ensure the non-certified contractor has and will follow a quality control program equivalent to the FBO system. So in other words, even though I'm not working at their facility, everything that I do has to be exactly is if I worked at the FBO. And that's why they need access to my facility to inspect and ensure that the quality work is the same as they would perform at their facility. The real benefit to me is that they sign off on all of my work. They have an office full of personnel that have the books, with all the requirements in there, they keep the files on hand. So I have an office staff that takes care of all of these uh, pertinent uh, steps that I don't have to mess with. So uh, for me, it's way easier, uh, way simpler to be a non-certified facility, let them handle the particulars to do with the paperwork, and let me concentrate on the quality of my work. Let me do what I do best and let them do what they are proficient at. It is understood that the FBO will continue to follow the quality control program of the non-certified facility by performing an on-site audit on an annual basis, either by the FBO or when the FBO and the FAA perform the on-site audit together. Now, the federal agency would be particularly interested in uh, performing the audit as well uh, if I were supplying parts for manufacturing and supplying parts or equipment to the aircraft industry. However, I am not doing that. I am only performing a service, and uh, part of... Uh, uh, the FBO's job in using me for the service is also uh, taking care of the burn certifications. So all the burn certs are handled, kept on file, and that will, uh, in my case, satisfy the FBO and the FAA 
uh, concerning that aspect of my work. The non-certified contractor gives written authorization that will allow the FAA access to its facilities for the purposes of meeting the FBO requirements. The FAA may make an inspection and observe the performance of the non-certified person's work, meaning that they are welcome at any time to observe the repair processes, the stripping of parts, the recoding of parts, anything that I do is an open book uh, to the FAA. Now it just so happened that the last two jobs in the shop went out that morning, so I had an empty shop. I had to deliver some cushions from this RV uh, and put them back in the RV non-repaired because the customer decided that they didn't want to spend the money finally. I should have vetted the customer ahead of time. That's my fault. I'll learn a lesson from that. Both choices, the vinyl or the microfiber as replacements, were about the same price, about $35 a yard. And because of the length of the top piece, uh, two yards were required, uh, plus shipping. Since I was already at the RV repair site at the time, I just took the cushions with me. Uh, so this just meant a short uh, extra trip to put them back in. Uh, no worries. Now the second job wasn't uh, my job. I had a friend text me this picture of a DeLorean Dash. He needed some assistance in seeing about uh, fixing it up or he could recover it. So I gave him some materials to work with. By the way, the one-inch structural foam we talked about in our last video is exactly the same thickness as the basic structural foam on the DeLorean Dash. So if that information proves helpful to him, then he will also freely pass that on to people that uh, are in the car club, which just goes to prove that one good turn deserves another. And just one more thing, the question about the drug and alcohol program, since you're working on aircraft. Well, I knew where to buy the alcohol, but I told him I didn't even know where to start buying the drugs. So the inspection went fine, but I got one demerit on the cognitive portion of the audit. So let's move on now to the armrest repair on the Lincoln. To be on the safe side, I want my thread to be about three times the length of the repair itself. And the vinyl offers almost uh, no resistance to the needles, so I don't need the leather needle. I can use the round tip needle, the same as I would use for the cloth. So I'm going to start from the inside and come out through the one of the original stitch holes. I can set that aside and get the other needle started the same way. Now I can even up the lengths and start sewing. Now the stitch holes on the Lincoln are very close together. And so what I've decided to do is to go every other hole. And that's a compromise I'm willing to live with. If you'd like to do differently, then that's fine also. After that, I can come up from the bottom on the stitch hole directly across. Now with the other needle, we will mirror what we just did. And we'll share the hole with the thread that we just put through. And the real secret to this method is to pull only as tight as joins the two pieces together. It's best not to get too exuberant and pull too tightly. 
That's especially true when we get down to the part that's not broken. And so I snug each one as I go. Now you probably are well familiar with the Ford Explorer that's got a very similar configuration. So in this older video you can see that the embossed uh, stitch in the vinyl is bigger and so the hand sewing thread features very well in that. And also you see that the stitches are longer and so for the Explorer, it's easy to go every single stitch. And so you can see there's a little difference uh, in the way I'm handling the Lincoln doing uh, every other stitch. That way uh, the job will take us 20 minutes instead of 40 minutes. Other than that though, it's the exact same process. If we didn't have the exact color thread as here, we could go back and just wipe some color into the thread. Now we'll speed through the next little bit, but we want to mention uh, the advantage of this system is that uh, over the years we've seen all kinds of repairs tried on these using some sort of a glue or goop, and they all fail and they all look horrible. So if we have a little bit of a compromise with the thread size and every other hole, we're still leaps and bounds beyond every other method that's ever tried. And so why is that true? It's because we need to consider the forces at play here. The vinyl has lost some of its plasticizer and can be less flexible. Also, the vinyl may have shrunk some. Also, the polyester foam that supports this vinyl has expanded in the heat and humidity. So we have the expansion and we have the shrinkage, we have less flexibility, and we cannot overlook the growing girth of people whose elbows are supporting their weight on these armrests. Anytime you see those forces at work in any part of an automobile, you already know that glue will not hold. Glue does not hold when there are those kinds of forces in play. That would be a general rule of thumb. For example, if you were given a brand new armrest and asked to pull it apart at this seam, you couldn't do it. No matter how hard you tried, you couldn't exert enough force. That should give you an idea of the forces at play when foam expands and when vinyl and leather shrink, or when plastic breaks. Glue is almost never the answer in those situations, we need to look for a mechanical bonding such as welding or as in this instance, using the thread to mechanically pull these pieces together and hold them. Unfortunately, we see way too many techs just reaching for glue in any situation like this. Now you probably noticed that uh, with the lower needle, I come up through the lower piece of vinyl first, and then on a second step, go through the upper vinyl. Uh, this is not necessary. You can do them both at the same time. It's just whatever is comfortable in your hand to do at any time. When we get here to where the vinyl is not broken, of course, we will have to go up from the bottom hole and up through the top hole all in one step. But basically it's whatever is comfortable for you to do. If it's faster to do them all at once, uh, no reason you can't do that. Uh, sometimes uh, doing them individually helps you to get a better aim, uh, get a better feel for where it's poking out uh, from the bottom to the top on the top side there.
We should also take this opportunity to mention that sometimes the armrests get beat down so bad that the underlying foam structure is gone. Now we did a video on a GM door panel where we reattached the armrest and there was no support. So in any model car, once the repair is done, we can take the door panel off, turn it upside down, and fill the void inside the armrest with our spray insulation foam. It may take several hours for that to cure really well, uh, but when we're finished, uh, you will have full support of your repair in that armrest. And the nice feature about injecting that foam is that you no longer get the same kind of movement that tends to break a repair loose. So here is where the vinyl is still held together, so we do both holes at the same time here. Now, one thing that you want to pay attention to here is when the seam is intact and you still want to keep some tension on the thread, it will tend to pucker the good part. So there's a careful balance there. You can probably see where the part that's good wants to pucker out a little bit. All the parts that are broken want to tuck in nicely together. Uh, that's the main concern of mine when I do these. If it's not just one split, if it's two splits, it's the in-between part that's difficult to keep flush with the other repaired areas. So it's a matter of having enough tension on the thread to hold the repair together, but not too much tension on the thread to pucker the good part. So we'll just run this thing out to the end. I am going to run a couple of stitches past the damaged area and then we'll go ahead and anchor this off. So, having gone a few stitches over to the good part, I am leaving a loop on my thread, just enough to add a little bit of a gel glue to the thread itself. So just judge about how much thread you're going to pull in there. Leave a tiny loop. Add some glue directly to the thread. And the object of this is to pull the glue in. And the gel glue is not going to be your instant variety. So it'll stay wet for a while. You can pull the thread in, wipe off any excess.
Sometimes some of the glue residue will leave it uh, looking a little bit whitish uh, in the thread. We can usually just clean that down and it disappears, but if we need to add a little bit of black to the thread itself, we can always do that. So the idea is to pull that glue on into the vinyl, let it harden on the inside. I'm going to do that uh, one more time. So we have several stitches through the good part of the vinyl. And the glue, in this case, acts as a lock stitch. Uh, so with the lock stitch in place, there's no need then for us to tie a knot and try to bury the knot. We just have several stitches through the good part of the vinyl where there's no pressure against them. The vinyl is still holding together. And we have a couple more stitches further along with some lock stitch. So that's it for this repair. It's rather simple, clean. It's something that uh, a lot of you are doing already. Uh, if you're doing it a little differently, no worries. But this gives us an opportunity also to discuss all of the forces involved in a repair and some basic principles behind why we choose the repair method that we do. I don't know why this is. It's like I'm on a winning streak lately, but I will be working on a car and it will sell immediately. I had also, uh, when I finished with this, just a little bit of damage on the seat to repair. And I'm just getting finished with the seat repair and a salesman brings a customer by. So I wipe some color on the seat so they don't see it immediately. <laughs> and the customer bought it right then and there. Thanks for watching.